mi tarea es as an outgrowth of my master's degree thesis. Mm, there I studied the completely mathematically rigorous derivation of the Einstein field equation from the Einstein field reaction. Song that is very well known, but I just leave it here in order to fix notation. And I've studied the Palatini formalism that for those of you who maybe are not very acquainted with it, uh, well, the relevant reference is this paper by Bernard and Sanchez, among others. And it's enough to say that uh, when you take a metric and a connection as independent variables and perform variational calculus to the action, you find that the solutions are the pairs in which G solves the Einstein field equation and the connection nabla is given by this formula in terms of the bit vita connection and arbitrary one form A. And well, in, the, in the paper, it is argued that this one form A is undetectable physically. We wonder uh, what geometrical meaning this one form could have. And at least uh, it allows us to define a natural notion of palatine divergence that uh, might be worth analyzing. Well, so when one studies uh, variationally the Einstein field equation, as I did, it is natural to ask uh, if you can fix a prescribed tensor as the right hand side. Term. And it turns out that taking literally, this is impossible because we have this result that tells us that, that there isn't any material Lagrangian, a list of order zero uh, that could yield uh, such a term. But then uh, what happens is that this equation with a prescribed tensor that we want, that we want to study is almost variational in a sense. Because if we work with a certain family of matter Lagrangians, uh, the ones given by this formula, where we have introduced a new scalar field, we have this result that is telling us that among critical points, the ones that solve the equation that we want are precisely those that have the physically correct divergence. Uh, in case that this sounds a bit confusing, you can think of it in the case of a, of a cosmological constant lambda, where this differential here vanishes. And then we have this other result that tells us that if a solution of the equation that we are studying also satisfies this condition on square curvature, then automatically it is a critical point of the action. So the conclusion is that in a sense, we obtain this equation with a prescribed right hand side and variationally. But well, now what do we do with all this? Uh, well, what we are analyzing are some aspects uh, about this. Uh, first, the cosmological function uh, can be interpreted physically as a source of the stress energy tensor because of this identity of the, of the divergence. But it also can be interpreted as, as a kind of a gauge function. And it turns out that we can also introduce another gauge transformation with this arbitrary function u. And then this u can be also interpreted as a source of a divergence, but in this case of a Palatini divergence. And as our metrics are critical points of an Einstein-Hilbert-Palatini action, what we can wonder if, if, if the, the Palatini divergence has any meaning uh, that is similar to that of the metric divergence and that is relevant for these for these solutions. A bit in some particular cases that, that are physically interesting. And finally, um, I think that the new fields may have some interest in certain instances of general relativity, and particularly in the, in the Fincelerian ones that are the ones that interest us the most. Um, this is all I can say for the moment. So, Thank you to the organizers to, for inviting me. Just, just to say that this is part of also my, my master's thesis with Maria Melilon, and then we just kept working on it. We need to work in progress, but so I'm going to talk about this. So 
Uh, we're going to do a motivated survey on conformal geodesics. Uh, first of all, we need to find what the uh, conformal Lorentzian manifold is, which is basically of equipping the manifold with a unique metric. You get it, you equip it with a conformal class of metrics. And in this sense, when you, when you have different metrics, then uh, the levity beta connection isn't the perfect one anymore, in the sense that uh, for different metrics, you have different uh, levity beta connections, and so you have different geodesics. So you cannot say that a geodesic are well defined in a conformal manifold. So here, where uh, the the topic of conformal geodesics comes in, it is just find a family of curves that can somehow generalize and have good properties in a conformal manifold. So I'm going to start with uh, some that uh, so there was this object called conformal circles uh, used by first by Yano, which is uh, satisfying this equation. So as you can see, there's the key I'm using here is the Sheldon tensor, which is particularly good in conformal geometry in terms of the of the of the conformal uh, relation between different different metrics. So you have Yano's and Obvious uh, are using this equation here. And then there appear lots of different equations in, in literature, uh, starting by or Bailey and Eastwood or Belguns. But the thing is, you can, after reparameterization, you, you can find that this, uh, these curves are related. And, and the good thing about one of them is Belguns, which is the one that uh, has the conformal uh, parameterization which is a great one with uh, particularly good properties. So the thing is, conformal circles are like a previous object, object and you and Ferrand uh, also used another object called uh, conformal geodesics, which for Bailey and Eastwood were exactly the same as conformal circles and same for Kuhn. Sorry? Okay, so I'll keep on. Uh, about the construction of conformal geodesic, which are the same that Ogi and Ferran are using. Uh, so we, we need to have a, a Cartan connection, a normal Cartan connection, and then a, the first prolongation of the conformal bundle. So let me do this very quickly, just a sketch. But you can consider the bundle of conformal frames, then define what the vertical space is, vertical tangent space is, then you have a displacement one form here. I'm sorry for going too fast, but just five minutes. Um, and then you have a torsion associated to it. So the first prolongation is basically uh, the hypersurfaces of the of the conformal frame bundle, which are horizontal and torsion frame. Uh, in this sense, we can now define what a conformal geodesic is. It is basically the the integral lines of the fundamental vector fields on the first prolongation of the conformal bundle, which are also uh, horizontal and, and uh, horizontal with respect with the, to the normal conformal Cartan connection, which is the preferred one in this conformal manifold. So now that we have this object, that there are actually curves over the first prolongation of the conformal bundle, but we can, we can consider, consider them as curves over the manifold just by projecting them. Uh, we can actually take, uh, take coefficients here and we find these equations here. So actually a conformal geodesic is a, a triple here in the first prolongation of the conformal, of the conformal bundle, which satisfies this. So they are pretty simple equations. And actually, if you, if you are just considering the set of points, then you can you can take this third order equation, which is after uh, reparameterizing it. In in this sense, how how can we say that conformal geodesics are good objects? But for example, um, the null conformal geodesics are actually the conformal geodesics. I the sorry, the null conformal geodesics are actually the null geodesics after reparameterizing them. Uh, and so relating them to to the conformal circles. Every conformal geodesic can be reparameterized to be a conformal circle. And also, uh, we have an example here by Paul Todd, 
which give us uh, the conformal geodesics of the Minkowski spacetime, given the conformal class of the of the usual metric. And so here you can say that the the ones that are space like with the space like uh, acceleration uh, happen to be circles. So that might be related with how we call these conformal circles. And finally, I just wanted to say how are we using this because this is just a survey. But uh, so we're using this to generalize a uh, Giannonian Picciones uh, characterization of, of the the, um, the geodesic connectedness on stationary, on the stationary space lines because you can somehow use it the same the same argument to 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 use it in conformally stationary space lines which are um, the manifold the conformal manifolds admitting a time like conformal vector field which is complete. So I think that's all, and I didn't spend too much time. Good afternoon to all. Well, today I am going to talk about a work of mine in Panesherp with Flores and Costa e Silva that deals with obtaining closed geodesics in Romania and Lorentz manifolds from QO loops or geodesic loops. This work is still in progress as the time is reduced, so I will focus on the main parts of the document. The slides are very didactic, so afterwards, if anyone wants the file just yes, ask via my email below. We know that compact remaining manifold have closed geodesics, but the non-compact case is more complex because it may not even admit closed geodesics. In in the figure below on the left, we have a compact manifold, the towers, uh, which have a closed geodesic and on the right, a non-compact manifold that has no geodesic of this type. In the case of a, a Lorentz manifold, we will have three types geodesics, time-like, new, and space-like. Uh, here we are more, more interested in causal geodesics. Here there may, may be no causal geodesics even uh, if the manifold is compact. Hi, uh, here I bring some results of time like closed geodesics in compact manifolds, Kepler, Kelly, Gediri. Gediri and Gediri. Uh, here, are, here are some discussion of Flores loops and the results in 12. Uh, well, our objective is to adapt the techniques the Flores used in the high level degree theorem to obtain an analogous result for Lorentz manifolds. And in the remaining case, it is to exclude or weak the hypothesis of, of non-self-conjugation. In the remaining case, we obtain the Follow a result via discussion of Q loops. This result does not depend on self conjugation, and we wish to find a weaken their uh, high level hypothesis. 
in the Lorentz case, we get this result. Note that the manifold is not necessarily compact. Here we want to find conditions that guarantee the existence of locally make amazing to time like close the loops. References. References. Thank you so much. Muitas gracias. Sorry. And in particular, everything I'm going to talk about is, um, or I was planning to talk about, is centered on the Gauss and Kodasi equations. And measuring the five minutes I would have to present it, I, I compiled just a part of what would have been in the poster. I hope that's okay. So the title is a little bit changed. By anisotropic, I mean in, in Finsler submanifolds. Uh, Finsler Gauss and Kodasi equations. Um, may, I, may I start then? Yes, yes. Okay. And, and you can all see the, the slide that's currently on the screen? Yes, we can see. Perfect. So um, the first uh, slide here um, features the, the equations. As we have calculated it, um, I've, I've been working on, on this theorem jointly with um, my tutor, Dr. Havalois, who did a presentation this morning. And a lot of what I'm going to uh, speed through here, he will explain in more details and more rigorously tomorrow morning. Um, essentially, it's the same equations, but there are extra terms which ought to be zero in the isotropic case if things no longer depend on the choice of a, of a vector uh, in a tangent vector. You see here that G sub B, the metric tensor, depends on the choice of a direction. Uh, if it doesn't, then all the extra terms are zero, and we find, again, the first equation here is the Gauss equation, and the second one is the Kodasi equation of a submanifold. Uh, let me start then uh, just by quickly um, recalling, or rather anticipating on, on uh, tomorrow's talk. The churn connection is obtained by um, looking at what happens when one takes the derivative of an anisotropic metric tensor. There is an, by the chain rule, there is a vertical derivative that will appear. Here I'm, I denoted it by a sort of a delta nu. It's a bit difficult to, to to distinguish the new from the B, everything is a bit confusing, the notation is a bit confusing, but you can see it. Um, oh, I just realized that I, I you can't see me. Uh, I, maybe it's all right, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it later. Um, later, I'll try and activate my camera. Um, this last term that I highlighted in blue will, when, when you make everything tensorial by uh, playing around with the, completing these uh, derivatives with the, with the connection, um, with the connection coefficients, you, the, this, this um, chain rule manifests as an extra term that's going to be called the Carton tensor. And the Carton tensor will mean that when we uh, manipulate these uh, cycled equations uh, to obtain the um, Levi-Civita connection, we no longer obtain the Levi-Civita connection, we obtain what is going to be called the Chern connection. Uh, and the, the causal formula corresponding to, to the churn connection will have extra Carton tensor terms, which again are zero in the isotropic case, and we come back to the levi civita connection. The extra Carton tensor terms in the churn connection mean that when we compare here, the lower equation is going to be nabla for the ambient churn connection of some manifold, some Finsler manifold. And nabla hat is going to be the churn connection intrinsic to a sub-manifold of, of that Finsler manifold. And we can no longer identify all the terms because of these Carton tensors. And so the difference is going to be tensorial in terms of the Carton tensor. We use the property, which I'm not going to prove here, that when I evaluate C sub V at V, that is, if Z, Y, or X is, is equal to V, the terms are going to cancel. The Carton tensor evaluated at V is zero. So that means that um, we can define the difference, which I'm going to call Q, the difference between the connection induced by the ambient churn connection and the um, intrinsic churn connection of the, the submanifold. So that's what I call, and some references call the Gauss formula. 
saying that when I decompose the, the ambient term connection, I find that the tangent part is the intrinsic term connection plus a Q term. And then the, um, the rest is, is the second fundamental board. If uh, then I dive right into the, the proof of the Gauss and Kodasi equation, which is very straightforward and fairly fast once you know what you're doing, uh, decomposing the, here the R uh, on the top left uh, stands for the anisotropic curvature tensor of the turn connection, which can be calculated by uh, doing the following. If you consider that uh, NABLA, the turn connection, is an anisotropic um, connection, but if you evaluate it in V, then suddenly it just behaves like a, a regular connection. So what you're going to do is calculate the curvature tensor, the isotropic curvature tensor associated to that. And then you're gonna subtract a vertical derivative of the connection to obtain a tensor which does not depend on the choice of extension V. And that's what we call R sub V, the anisotropic curvature tensor. So if we start uh, naively decomposing the, the parts of this intermediate curvature tensor, uh, uh, the, the first step where things start to go differently is that defining the covariant derivative of the second fundamental form, we need to add a vertical derivative of that second fundamental form. And this is going to be relevant later. We obtain uh, this expression relating these intermediate curvature tensors. And when we subtract vertical derivatives denoted by P, the vertical derivatives of the respective uh, connections, uh, we obtain um, expressions independent from the choice of extension. And those are the ones that we call the anisotropic curvature tensors. Using the um, Gauss formula that in form of vertical derivatives, we can combine all these vertical derivatives that appear into the, the following tensorial forms. And that's almost done, we're almost done. We only need to express this curvature tensor of the induced connection in terms of the curvature tensor of the intrinsic churn connection of the submanifold. And then we'll have some Q terms that will appear. And to do that, we do essentially the same thing that we've just did, but with, without just um, decomposing between the tangent and orthogonal part. Now we're decomposing between the uh, churn connection and Q part. But it's a similar definition that we give uh, to the derivative, covariant derivative of Q. Maybe some authors may differ, but all the terms are going to be the same uh, afterwards. The method is rigorously the same. By doing this, we obtain the same way a relation between the, the anisotropic curvature tensors. And we can reinsert that into the main expression. In this main expression, you will realize that there is this uh, last uh, tangent part of NABLA second fundamental form that's uh, you still have to manipulate in when you multiply by a tangent vector, that's the Gauss formula, you want to pass the NABLA to the other side and, and get an expression where you have the product of the two second fundamental forms. But when you do that, there is a Kalten tensor that will appear. And if you look at the penultimate line in this slide, taking the derivative of this equality, you obtain the equality below, which will allow you to eliminate, when you do this on these two terms, you eliminate the vertical derivatives of the second fundamental form appearing elsewhere. You shouldn't have to worry about this normally because you can do an election, you can uh, choose a certain extension such that all of these terms are going to be zero anyway. I mean, in this case, uh, not evaluating the second fundamental form, but evaluating NABLA. So there are, there are tricks to, to make this a little more uh, to, to save space, let's say, but uh, I like to do it this way because then you see where the things come from in general without choosing a, an extension. So to recapitulate, uh, in this uh, naive development, this uh, first um, um, uh, curvature tensor term is going to give us the curvature tensor of the intrinsic connection plus some Q terms. Then we do the little manipulation with the NABLA second fundamental form to get the product of second fundamental forms and some Cartan tensors. And then we'll have a vertical derivative of the ambient churn connection term. And this is our Gauss formula. Everything else goes to the Godassi formula. And uh, that's it for the theorem. One application is that um, we, are, we have, we have uh, developed, uh, Dr. Habalais and I, 
was to consider what happens when you are in a vector space on which you um, you place a randos metric. In this case, uh, we're interested in the in the Gauss formula, the first of these two equations. The left hand side is zero, and the first term of the right hand side. If we set x equals to v equals to u, and then y equals to z, this is up to a factor, the, 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 the flag curvature, which uh, I have here uh, defined. Uh, I didn't include it in the slides. I don't know if you see that. This is a flag curvature. This is how you define it. It's essentially the sectional curvature, but you choose the same direction as the sub v. And you can isolate that in the first equation if the left-hand side is zero. In the case of the um, of, of the, the these uh, so-called randos minkowski spaces, the last terms are zero. All these p terms are zero. By um, the the this um, this uh, reference here, curvature computation in tensor geometry, which which I just indicated. And it turns out that uh, if you express everything in terms of the, the Cermelo navigation data, that means uh, you're considering that these randos metrics, which have been introduced this morning, are the, you, you can identify them in terms of their indicatrix. And the indicatrix is displaced by some wind. So it's really a Euclidean sphere displayed by some wind. And when you do that, the Cartan tensor is remarkably simple. And so we get a generic expression for the flag curvature of any uh, submanifold in a in a randos miskowski space and and that's it i think uh, my five minutes are over how, how does it look did i did i overdo it okay thank you very much first of all uh, for the record i wanted to express my appreciation for the organizers for putting together this wonderful event even though all the, the circumstances that are going on and this here the idea is more or less like this. Well, we all know like what a trapped surface is because of general relativity. But here, uh, this work sort of focuses on geometric properties of marginally trapped submanifolds, which are essentially when the mean curvature vector is light-like at all points. And here I'm thinking that this is happening, let's say, inside a space-time. Later, more generally, we can think of a pseudo Riemannian manifold. Okay, and from the point of view, like of relativity, again, the idea is that marginally trapped surfaces they separate the trapped surfaces from the non-trapped surfaces in the sense that all all the light rays, like emanating from the marginally trapped surface, they actually converge immediately at one point. Now, if you think about the geometry of such submanifolds, trying to classify them in general, it's sort of a hopeless mission. So what people do and have been doing for a long time is try to add some more geometric conditions and see what you can say about it. So this here, uh, just to mention that, again, why is this relevant, right? Because, well, the notion of trapped surface was introduced by Penrose in the 60s and it led him to winning the, the Fields Medal last year. So that should by itself be enough of a justificative, okay? So some of the geometric conditions we'll try to study together with this are like this. So we're going to say that a submanifold is critical if the mean curvature vector is equal to zero. We're all familiar with this. Marginally trapped if the mean curvature is light-like. Already went over this. Pseudombilic if the shape operator associated to the mean curvature vector is a multiple of the identity. And in this case, you have no choice. By taking trace, you see that this function is going to be the scalar square of age. And lambda isotropic, if where lambda is a, a given smooth function, if for every vector field tangent to, to the submanifold, you have this expression here relating the scalar square of the second fundamental form. Okay? So those are the conditions that will try to play along with the, the marginally trapped condition and see which results we get, okay? Here, I'm just establishing notation for pseudo Riemannian space forms in general, okay? Uh, the curvature parameter will always be minus one, zero, or one. I won't think too much about this. Here are particular cases. And one useful tool that 
people do is actually to look at a, a Penrose frame or a, a, an asymptotic frame. Because since the codimension of the submanifold is equal to two, you can take two normal vectors, but you take both of them to be no, and with their product being a constant. So here's one tentative picture in Minkowski space. Okay. Here, this second lemma here, this lemma number two, it's not really a, a big deal. It's just for the matter of organizing things because we're just writing the geometry of the submanifold in terms of this frame. So, all right. So the first interesting result here that was originally proved by Henri Anciot in this first paper here, marginally trapped submanifolds in space forms of arbitrary signature. Uh, we're trying to adapt this here and correct a little mishap that he had. But the thing is, this little correction here uh, led us uh, to adapt some other results from those other two papers here uh, about isotropic and marginally trapped surfaces. Yeah, and this here, this is just the classical reference by O'Neill. All right, so here, uh, essentially they say that if you, if you have that the second fundamental form is always proportional to one of the new vectors, then age also is, that's clear, take trace, add the rank of the, the, the derivative of this, no vector here is at most one. And if the submanifold is space-like, the converse holds, not in general. Okay, there are counterexamples. And this thing here was used to get our first, let's say, quote unquote, rigidity result that essentially says that if if you have a submanifold which is contained in a new hyperplane, then the second fundamental form is also null in the sense this, uh, the sectional curvature is constant and the normal bundle is flat. And there's also this converse that if it has uh, no second fundamental form, then locally the, the submanifold is also contained in a new hyperplane. Okay, so this is like, let, let's say it's one first factory of ex examples of, of submanifolds with this property. Now, Changing the argument just a little bit here, uh, we can also prove that if you have a submanifold of a space form, which is actually trapped with flat normal bundle and simply connected here, then it's also contained in, in a no hyperplane. And this result here is particularly interesting because this is a direct generalization of the fact that if you look in Minkowski tree space, the space-like curves with degenerate osculating planes, then those curves are actually contained in no planes because those curves are actually the marginally trapped submanifolds in Minkowski tree. That's an extreme example in which case you see that the flat normal bundle assumption and the simply connectivity, they are automatically satisfied. So that's one small generalization here, okay? Uh, Moving on, another result that deserves some small comments that was uh, originally proved by Cabrerizo, Fernandez, and Gomez is that this lemma here, they had proved this. You see, like you, you have this relation between the scalar square of the mean curvature, the isotropy function, which is part of our assumption in this case, and the extrinsic curvature, meaning the discriminant, like quote unquote, the determinant of the second fundamental form over the determinant of the first one. So you, you have this relation here. And originally they had proved this under the assumption that your surface is space-like and the ambient is Lorentzian. Pretty much the same computations they did in, in, in that paper works out. So you can also assume that your surface is Lorentzian and uh, the ambient manifold can have any signature and that's fine, okay? and as a consequence of this small generalization, one of the theorems they had in that paper that again was originally stated for Lorentzian ambience and space-like surfaces also works in this case. And of course, here by marginally trapped in, in the case where M is Lorentzian, I, I'm being a bit loose with the use of the terminology. I'm just saying that, you see, if, if the surface is Lorentzian inside an, a neutral space, then the normal spaces are also Lorentzian. And so it makes sense for you to ask the, for, for the mean curvature vector to be null. So that's the condition I have in mind here. And again, you have this relation with the pseudo mobility condition here from the beginning, and also with isotropy. 
which in, in this case it's interesting because being lambda isotropic is equivalent to being zero isotropic. So it's not like you have much freedom to do things here. Okay. And the last result here worth mentioning, uh, again, it was originally stated uh, in those papers when the ambient space here, the, the, the from header dimension four, but with this generalization here of theorem four, we could do this for any dimension. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay, which essentially, of course, I had to add a few assumptions here to make sure that things would work, but I don't want to drag too much on this. So essentially, if you have uh, a nice, let me put it like this, a nice submanifold, okay, uh, then if it's zero isotropic, then you actually know what it's congruent to. And the strategy of this proof here was more or less uh, straightforward in the sense that you know that this guy here by theorem four, it's going to be contained in a new hyperplane. So you take an isometry that maps the normal new vector to this guy here. You compose this, this linear isometry with the central projection. And this thing turns out to be a pseudo Riemannian covering because it's going to be a local isometry. We're assuming that the manifolds are complete, so it's a pseudo Riemannian covering. And the simply connectedness assumption will say that this is a global isometry. So that's like the, the strongest rigidity theorem I, I could adapt from that paper. And those things here were essentially things that I studied when I was doing my master's back in Sao Paulo. And I thought just commenting on those things would be adequate for a five minute presentation. And I hope I didn't go over the time. So I'll stop here. Thank you.